and the red letter day in genome sequencing history was in 2001 when the human genome was sequenced in comparison to all these genomes human genome was much larger in size as also much more complex given that it has a more than 50 percent repeat content right and then since the sequencing of the human genome other genomes got sequenced very quickly uh, because we had standardized the techniques required for sequencing a large and a complex uh, genome like the human genome so very quickly 2002 you have mouse genome 2004 rat genome then chimpanzee genome came in through 2005 likewise or as a set of our rice genome came up in 2005 then you had other organisms and you also could sequence some of the extinct species for example you now have a partial sequence of the neanderthal genome and then of course uh, the famous gila cell line was sequenced in 2013 and uh, then zebra fish or any rare was sequenced in 2013 again and by the end of 2017 we were able to sequence uh, a genome that is roughly 10 times larger than the human genome or xenopus levis and uh, some of the reference papers uh, this is a good reference paper for you dna sequencing at 40 past present and future and then i also recommend you go through this paper here the axolotl genome and the evolution of key tissue formation regulators right uh, this is basically the paper that reports the sequencing of the axolotl genome or xenopus levis so uh, by now i'm sure you would be losing the context of this lecture that is uh, large insert vectors so let's uh, now bring in that context back into our picture why do we require large insert vectors and uh, as i told you genome sequencing is complex and sequencing human genome for the first time was a very daunting and complex task and therefore people develop strategies so as to ensure that they do not go wrong in sequencing the human genome so let me give you an analogy to genome sequencing strategies right so here is a picture of uh, eiffel tower which i clicked when i was in paris uh, the challenge is to break this picture into very small pieces and reassemble it back into the original picture right this is what you exactly do when you do sequence the genome first you break it into smaller pieces and once you have your sequence or individual pieces then you put them together to get the final genome sequence right and uh, the ordering of the fragments then becomes important or the assembly step becomes very important so there are two ways i can go about uh, disrupting this picture and reassembling it back into the original picture one way is where i directly break it into very small pieces and then reassemble it back into the original picture uh, the only problem is that when i break it into larger pieces directly there is every chance that I could confuse this piece with this piece and put this one here and this one here, right? So this is going to be more error prone, right? The other way I can uh, do this uh, challenge is to first break it into larger pieces and then break each individual piece into smaller pieces, right? So whatever error I do in assembling this part here, the error remains localized only to the first panel it doesn't flow over to the second panel so this strategy here is less error prone so this strategy here is known as the whole genome shortening strategy which can be used to sequence smaller size genomes usually prokaryotic genomes because the size is small also the repeat content is less which means that there is very less confusion whether this piece belongs here or this piece belongs here so therefore with the smaller genomes are uh, usually the prokaryotic genomes where the size is small and the repeat content is less this whole genome shortcut sequencing strategy can be used directly however when you're sequencing a genome as complex as a human genome then you have to follow what is known as the hierarchical shotgun sequencing strategy where you first break the genome into larger pieces and when you have these larger pieces these larger pieces have to be cloned into large insert vectors right which is basically your bacterial artificial chromosomes East artificial chromosomes, right? So that is the context that we have been trying to build around, so as to bring you back into the uh, into the context of the vectors again, right? So these would represent your large insert vectors, and then of course uh, you break individual piece into smaller pieces, which are amenable to Sanger sequencing. Sequence out each of these smaller pieces, assemble locally the all fragments obtained from the first large fragment. 
uh, whatever errors you do in assembling this first large fragment is localized still only to the first fragment, doesn't spill over to the second fragment or the third fragment or the fourth fragment. And once you do your assembly of individual uh, large fragments, then you put them together to get your final picture here, which is this one here. So this is where the, uh, the requirement for large insert vectors comes in. And uh, the backs and yaks are specifically developed uh, to ensure that the hierarchical shotgun sequencing strategy followed by the human genome project can be implemented. Right? So this is the context in which you're talking about backs and the axe. You have a large piece of DNA that you want to sequence. The actual hierarchical uh, shotgun sequencing strategy entails two-step cloning. First, a large fragment library is created here, uh, which would be cloned into the bacterial artificial chromosomes or yeast artificial chromosomes. So here you are, you create your large fragment library first. Each of these fragmenters uh, is basically inserted in an artificial chromosome and is stably maintained. Also, what is important is to ensure that you do not go wrong in the final assembly of the fragments. What you do is you decide the order of fragments at this stage itself, at the large fragment stage itself, right? So you know that this is your first fragment, this is the second fragment, this is the third one, the fourth one, or the fifth one, right? So once you have your large fragment library and you've also deciphered the order of fragments in that library, the individual large fragments are now fragmented further into plasmid library, small fragment library, which is amenable to Sanger sequencing. So you generate the sequences for individual large fragments here, right? So this is what to do. You do the sequencing of fragments here. Uh, once you get this uh, reads from these plasmid libraries, you are able to arrange them into order. There are several strategies that are used here as well, including use of markers, use of uh, genetic map, use of physical map, restriction fingerprinting. And then, of course, uh, you finally have your uh, assembly of the se sequence and individual fragments, once they are sequenced, you know the order and that allows you to finally get the entire genome sequence here. So a major requirement for the success of hierarchical shotgun sequencing was to generate vectors that could stably hold large sized inserts, inserts as big as uh, 150 KB, 250 KB, 300 KB, or as big as 500 KB as can be held in YAKS or East Artificial Chromosomes. So with this background, we now move on and discuss uh, bacterial artificial chromosomes and East Artificial Chromosomes.